Chapter 2, All About Installing Windows. What we're going to be talking about is planning how to install Windows, how to install Windows, different uh, types of variations, and some concerns. Also, we're going to talk about what to do after it's installed. How to plan a Windows installation. Normally, we start planning if we have a new hard drive or a new hardware, uh, an older version gets corrupted, or upgrades. But those are just three common ones. Uh, it could just be that you want to get different experience. That also works. Uh, we focus predominantly on Windows 7. So we're going to cover some basic versions of Windows 7. The first one is Windows 7 Starter, which is really interesting because it's a bare, bare, bare bone, bare minimum Windows 7 environment. It's basically only for notebooks or developing nations, and only comes in the 32-bit version. That's it. Has no real other Windows 7 features whatsoever. But it's also the cheapest one out there. A common one for home users is either Home Basic or Home Premium. Uh, home Basic has limited features, and it says only available in underdeveloped countries. But Home Basic is actually shipped on a lot of stores here in the U.S. as well. It just it has limited features. It only has scheduled backups. It also includes a uh, 32 or 64 bit, but it doesn't include any of the uh, graphical add ons or graphical features like Arrow. That you have to go to Home Premium. Uh, we have a chart here in a few slides that actually cover all the basics, so just bear that for a second. Uh, last one in, on the slide is Windows 7 Professional, which is the professional is mainly intended for business use. All it really means is it has more networking capability and you can purchase site licenses. Site licenses is kind of important when we talk about Windows 7 because Home, Starter, those all normally come with a single license, which means you can only install them on one computer. Professional, however, you can get specialized volume licenses or site licenses that allows you to install it on multiple computers. If you're taking one of the IT classes, you'll notice that in a lab environment, you might have 20, 30, 40 plus PCs. It's easier to actually have one site license for all of the PCs. It just makes the licensing aspect of purchasing easier. Last slide are the last two major ones are Enterprise and Ultimate. Enterprise is very similar to Professional. However, you do not have Windows DVD Maker, as well as you have to contact Microsoft directly because you have to buy this as a bulk site license. You can't buy it individual. That's very special. It gets really weird because Windows 7 Ultimate is basically enterprise with the DVD maker included and not allowing the purchase of multi-site licenses. Ultimate's more along that home line, so one license, one PC, period, but it has some all of the uh, some additional features that the other ones have. Here is a quick overview of what features each version has. Notice again, Enterprise versus Ultimate, the only difference is the DVD maker. For some people that's a huge thing, for other people it's really not, but it's important to note that. Purchasing options. This is extremely important. Retail versus OEM. Essentially, is the license tied to the individual or the hardware itself. For example, let's say you, the technician, buy a copy of Windows 7 Retail. It comes in a box. But, who actually has that license? You, the person that bought it, 
or the hardware that you're putting it on. Retail specifically has to be tied to a person. Versus OEM, OEM is tied to the hardware itself. So if you buy, if you make a PC or buy a, re, a PC for resale, you have to put an OEM copy of Windows 7 on it. All that really means is the licensing goes with the computer versus you, the, the person. The licensing gets very convoluted with Microsoft. They actually have a large text document located on their website that explains licensing in greater detail, and it's a textbook in itself. What about the bit version? Does that really matter? Uh, 32 versus 64. Also, sometimes you might see it x86, which is really just 32 bit, or x64. All that really means is how much memory does it support? 2 to the power of 32 is around about 4 gigabytes. 2 to the power of 64 is a lot larger number. So if you have uh, more than 4 gigs of memory, you have to have 64-bit version, or the memory can't be used. That's a big one. Normally, the 64-bit also does better performance. Not always, but it has the ability to. Uh, the last bullet point, 64-bit installation of Windows requires 64-bit device drivers. Yes and no. You can actually run some 32-bit drivers. It doesn't run as well, but it, it will work. With Windows Vista, they actually had 64-bit signed drivers, but not all hardware manufacturers want to purchase or put their uh, drivers through that uh, rigorous of testing, so not all drivers were signed and that ran into some issues. So that's also uh, another concern is driver compatibility. Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. Normally do your research on the device and see if it supports both 32 and 64. Normally when you go to buy hardware, both are compatible but just verify the box or the documentation or the manufacturer just, just to make sure. This is an extremely important slide. Notice the graphics is a Windows 7 Home Premium Upgrade Retail Box. The retail box is apparently very important. Not really sure why, but for a lot of people, the retail you have to have that box is important. So verifying your system qualifies for the win uh, for Windows 7. This is one of those critical slides. For 32-bit and 64-bit uh, hardware, they're very similar, but not in all areas. Processor, both require a gigahertz processor or faster. So that's really common, so that shouldn't be an issue. For memory, though, for the 32-bit, you have to have at least 1 gig. For 64, you have to have at least 2 gigs of memory. For free hard drive space, for 32-bit, you have to have 16 gigs free. And for 64, you have to have 20 gigs. Last would be the video device and drivers. It needs to support at least DirectX 9 or higher. Again, this is one of those very important slides. I've noticed numerous questions on the A+. -plus that will play off of this slide just seeing a, just making sure that you knew the minimum qualifications or specifications for each version of Windows 7. Essentially for Windows 7 if you know the hardware specifications you can make sure that your PC is compatible. Normally this is not an issue with modern day computing, but if you have a PC that's fairly old, this might be a concern. So we're going to talk about the motherboard is BIOS. We have the system BIOS, which is basically just contains instructions for running the hardware devices before an OS loads. 
When you hit the power button, it will go through its startup process, but then it will actually turn on everything, all the hardware portions, before Windows loads. That's the system BIOS. Before that actually has the startup BIOS. When you hit the power button, it uh, uh, does its power on self, tests its posts, but then actually starts the computer and finds all the boot devices. Basically that looks for where the operating system is installed. And then it actually starts starting the process to turn on the operating system. Normally this happens within seconds, so most of the users never really see it. But if you ever had an issue with Windows not loading, normally it's in the startup BIOS area that we're having problems. Before that, we have our setup BIOS, which is basically a hardware uh, function where we go into the motherboard's BIOS and we set or turn on features of the motherboard. Set the clock, set startup devices. We're predominantly focusing on software, so going through the BIOS is not really a portion of this class, but it might be covered in the hardware course. The important thing for the startup BIOS is what device are you going to be checking for for an operating system first? Most of the time it's the hard drive, but it could also be the CD-ROM. It all depends on what you're doing. If you're installing a new copy of Windows, you actually want to load off the CD-ROM first, so you'd have to set up your BIOS to do that. Again, consult with the motherboard manufacturer and find out how to log into the BIOS and how to set that, or the hardware class should also cover that as well. What's a device driver? That's something we had already kind of talked about, but it's one of those important concepts that we need to cover again. Device drivers is basically a small program that allows the software to talk to the hardware. For example, you move your mouse. How does the computer know that you moved up, down, side, left, right? Device drivers actually allow the computer to take that input signal and make sense of it. That's all drivers. Very specifically, if you have a 32-bit operating system, you'd only get 32-bit drivers. If you have 64, you want 64-bit drivers. You want to match the versions just to make sure. D uh, device drivers normally are can be found either through Microsoft, but those are very generic drivers. You could also contact the person that made the hardware. Let's say you bought a video card from NVIDIA, for example. You go to NVIDIA's website and download drivers directly from them. It's important that you make sure that you always have current up-to-date drivers on your hardware. Drivers come out sometimes very regularly and they actually improve systems hardware performance or functionality. Again, very specifically with video drivers, they always are updating and they always add new features or new functionality that's always there. Uh, one thing within Windows 7, some actually have this Windows XP mode. Basically that's an environment that supports older applications. Windows 7 really changed the way that we thought about operating systems and some pro newer programs need that environment versus some older programs can't function very well in that environment. So we have to have a mode that allows us to use older programs. Most of our courses were using virtual machines. That also works. It's just a virtual machine is additional software you have to install versus XP mode that's there. Do you have to have a DVD-ROM to install Windows 7? That's an important question. No, you don't. If you have a Windows 7 DVD, then yes, you have to have a DVD-ROM, but that's not the only way to install it. You can copy it to a flash drive, you could have a portable or a USB DVD-ROM, you could do it other ways, like network mix as well. 
there's multiple ways to do this. An important thing to note while we're here is if your computer has a CD-ROM, which is different than a DVD-ROM, it might not it will not, not might, it will not read the Windows 7 DVD because you have to have a DVD-ROM or DVD drive to read the DVD. It's kind of like sticking a Blu-ray in a DVD player. The DVD player does not know how to read the Blu-ray. Same concept for the CD versus DVD. We were talking about BIOSes a little while ago, so I figured this is an older BIOS, but an important one for us to look over. Notice boot options. First, second, third. First one is removable. Second one is hard disk. Third one is CD-ROM. Removable could just be if you're installing via USB uh, jump drive. So I mean, check that first. But this really all depends on the, ex the situation that you're installing on. If it's a fresh install, I'd probably do CD or optical drive or DVD-ROM first. It says CD-ROM. Some older BIOSes detect DVD-ROM as CD-ROM. That's just how they're labeled. Any optical drive first. Second, normally hard drive. And the third one, whatever you would like. But if you're not installing Windows, probably with the hard drive first, just to make sure that Windows loads a little faster. Because whatever you put first during its startup BIOS phase, it will actually try to load from that area first. So, if you already have Windows installed and you have CD-ROM first, it will always check the CD-ROM first, even though you already have Windows installed. By setting the hard drive first, it helps save a second or two on your startup time. For some people that's a big issue, for some people it's not. Now let's talk about factory recovery partitions. Some computers when you buy them from like Dell or HP or Best Buy or Fry's, you get a factory recovery partition. Essentially that's just a section of the hard drive that was set aside for recovery. Normally we can re uh, just create recovery CDs or disks. We don't cover that in this chapter, we'll cover that in the next chapter when we talk about backups. But some hardware actually, or some computers actually have the recovery disks automatically built in. Some people like this, some people don't. Again, it's personal preference. But what I have noticed was it uses your hard drive space but you don't have to worry about finding your backup disks versus it not using your hard drive you making backup disks and then you have to find their backup disks because they both have pros and cons here's one example of a recovery disk maker but this is also built into Windows 7 which again we'll cover in the next chapter it's just it's really funny because people don't realize how much is actually built into Windows 7 that's already there for you. Since we talked about Windows XP mode, I figured now would be a good time to talk about installation in a virtual environment. We, for most of my classes, we do virtual machines because it's easy to use, easy to uh, set up, and you don't have to worry about damaging your physical or your host machine. But what, what are some of the reasons? One of the nice things is that virtual machine, you don't really have to worry about, about what people do in it because if it gets damaged, you can just delete it and install a new operating system and it normally only takes 15-20 minutes. So that, that's a, a huge reason. Also, you can install different operating systems. So let's say you have Windows 7 and you want to check out Windows XP or Windows 8 or any of the Linux or maybe some of the Mac OS's but you don't want to have to reinstall Windows on your computer or any other operating system on your computer you can do that through a virtual machine most of, again most of our class uses VMware Player but that's a quick easy way 
You can also test software in it. That's a huge, huge benefit as well. Uh, most popular virtual machines is going to be a Microsoft Virtual PC or VMware. VMware Player is their free one. VMware Fusion is their Apple-based one. VMware Workstation, which is their paid version. But there's other virtual programs out there as well. Just do your research and find which one you like best. Personal preference. I happen to like VMware Player just because it's it's free, it's easy. So the last slide that I want to talk about as we're talking about installation, basic installation is what type? Are there are there multiple types? Um, in place versus upgrade versus clean install versus dual boot. Uh, what does that all mean? Basically, a clean installation. I know I'm starting out of order, but I want to do clean installation first. Is it wipes out your old copy of Windows and all the old data, and then you get a fresh start. It's everything fresh. Versus an in-place upgrade, which is just an upgrade of an existing operating system. So you keep all of your data, but you also keep all of your problems, if you have any problems. So that's a concern sometimes. Another option is a dual boot, which is basically you set the, the hard drive for a computer, you section it off so that one hard drive or one portion of the hard drive loads one operating system and the other portion of the hard drive loads the second operating system. You'll notice in some of your classes one PC might have four or five copies of Windows 7 installed. That's considered a dual boot. Even though you have multiple copies, it's still called a dual boot. Notice I said in-place upgrade. There's other, ver or other copies or other types of upgrades. There's also a side-by-side -side upgrade as well. That's when you buy a new PC and you upgrade it, leaving your old PC by the side. You upgrade your new one, you get it to where you want it, then you copy the data from the old one to the new one. Sometimes that's tested on and that's called a side-by-side. -side. Now what type of path can we take? Let's say you have Vista Home Basic and you want to upgrade. Well, what can you upgrade to? Can you go from Vista Home Basic to Windows 7 Professional? No, you can't. You can only go to very specific versions. This slide outlines all of that. Notice XP is not here. You actually cannot currently go from XP to Windows 7. You have to go from XP to Windows Vista, from Vista to Windows 7, if you're doing upgrades. This slide is, again, important to know because there are questions that are specifically asked about upgrade paths. And Sometimes they try to purposely put tricky questions in there just to verify that you know this. Notice Vista Ultimate can only be upgraded to Windows 7 Ultimate. Vista Enterprise can only be upgraded to Windows 7 Enterprise. Where Vista Business can go from upgrade from it from Windows 7, Professional, Enterprise, or Ultimate. So I mean you kind of have to know that. That way, if you have a Vista business and you want to know what version you can upgrade to, you know. If you don't memorize it, at least know where you can find this chart. Choosing the type of installation, again, upgrade versus clean install versus dual boot. Other things to keep in mind is what bit version are you running? If you have a 32-bit copy of Vista, you cannot upgrade to a 64-bit copy. You have to stay within the bit version. So if you have Vista Business 64-bit, you can go to 
Windows 7 Professional, Enterprise, or Ultimate, but only in the 64-bit version. So you gotta gotta be careful with that. Uh, last thing to note when we talk about upgrades is if you are going from Vista to Windows 7, you actually have to have Service Pack 1 or later. Other considerations is size of the Windows partition. Is it completely empty and ready for you to use? Uh, a partition, you can also call a volume. A volume is just the hard drive space on, on a hard drive that you can use. Uh, that you can that you can actually assign a drive letter. You can actually decide if you want to use all the the space on a drive or part of the space on a drive. It really all depends on you, your needs. Keeping in mind though, you only have one physical. We're gonna assume that you only have one physical drive, but you can carve that up into four different partitions. Let's say you have a one terabyte drive or 1000 gigabyte drive. You can carve that up into four 250 gigabyte drives. I just carved it up equally, but if that one hard drive fails, all the partitions fail too. So you have to think about that when you do this. Now let's talk about the administrator account. This is one thing that Vista and 7 did that was a vast improvement with Windows XP. In XP, you when you logged in as the administrator, you had an administrator token. That token was basically gave you the ability to do whatever you'd like as the administrator, even when you did not need it. But the issue with that is, what happens if you log in as a user and you needed to do something that required administrator access? In XP, you couldn't do that. You had to be an administrator only. Vista and Windows 7, with the invent of the UAC, the user access controls, you could be a regular user and do something that requires administrative access, and it would prompt you for administrator credentials, a, a administrator username and password, while you were a regular user. That was fantastic. So you no longer had to log off and log back on as the administrator to do things. So that really changed the way that we did installation of software, and it's really helped. Also, what the UAC did in Windows 7 and Vista was even when you're logged in as the administrator, you're not really logged in as the administrator. You log in, you're given a user token. You can only do tasks that require the user token. If you want to do anything that's administratively done, you had to ask for the admin token. A UAC pop-up would be would pop up on the screen, do you want to continue? And you would get the ability to say yes or no. Because you are logged in as the administrator, but there's that additional step to help protect you. What that allows is Let's say you're browsing on the internet and you're logged in as an administrator. If your computer gets a virus, that virus only has access to your user token. Even though you're logged in as an administrator, that's part of the functionality of Windows 7. In XP, the virus would have the administrator token to do whatever it wanted. In Windows 7, because again, the administrator is no longer given that administrator token all the time, it's better security. Which that's actually extremely helpful with today's current viruses. Another way to actually install Windows is assuming we don't want to do it from a, a physical disk, we can do a, from a network. But I mean, we have to talk about network configuration first. Home groups versus work groups versus domains. A home group is essentially a work group, but for home. Essentially, it allows all the Windows 7 or uh, current multi Windows multimedia devices to share resources. 
I know this says Windows 7, but if you have an Xbox, for example, you can share data to and from it from a Windows 7 PC or from your Xbox itself. It's less secure than a work group, but again, it's, it's mainly for home users. A work group is essentially the same as a home group, just additional rights and uh, access to additional files or resources. This is different than a domain. A domain is centralized. Basically what that means is on a dedicated machine it actually has all the usernames and all the passwords and everyone contacts that server to log on. For example in the classroom you'll notice that if you ch update a password on one PC and you you change seats your updated password works. That's actually because when you update on one computer you're actually updating the server password or the passwords that are stored on the server. Versus a work group, your account would be tied to that individual PC. There is no centralization. So that's an issue. Here's a graphic rep representation of a work group. Everyone shares everything with everyone. But user accounts are individual on each computer. Here's an example of a domain. Everything is centrally connected to that central server or domain controller. The user accounts, again, are controlled on, on that domain controller. If you update passwords on one, you can switch to a different computer, and it's updated because all the passwords are stored on the domain controller. Here's some questions to ask yourself when you start dealing with installation of Windows 7. Does it meet hardware qualifications? Do you have a product key? Does your product key or your serial key correspond to the version you're installing? For example, your key might be for Windows 7 Home Premium, but you accidentally installed Professional. You have a home premium key, it will not work with professional. How will the user uh, share or access resources? That's another important question. Addressing questions as well. Are you doing a clean installation or an upgrade? Are you doing a dual boot? Those are all very important questions. The last one I would consider is the most critical question especially as a technician. Did you back up user data? Is that data somewhere? Do you have adequate backups of it? Normally you do not touch someone's PC until you do a complete backup of their data. Data runs everything. Any uh, loss of data? That can be a big, big, big issue. So you want to make sure that you have backups. Final checklist before the installation is make sure you have all the device drivers that you're going to need, the, the disks that allow you to install the software you need, uh, you have all the backups, you have your antivirus, uh, if you're using a laptop you have an adequate battery charger or battery charge or you have the adapter Notice, again, the second bullet point, back up all important data. This is important. One thing that could not be stressed enough is backups. Got to make sure you have that copy of that data. So now we're going to talk about how to perform step-by-step -step in place upgrades versus clean install versus dual boots. Again, notice side-by-side -side upgrade is not covered. It's there, it's just not covered. It's pretty similar to an in-place, just with a different PC. If you have your documentation, now's a good time to have it. So that you have your product key, you have your serial number, you have any of the important passwords that you're going to need, or you know where they're at at least.
I'm not going to cover step-by-step -step instruction on how to do upgrades. We'll do this as labs. But here are the first seven steps for an upgrade. Notice the important one is check compatibility, which is step three. Accept the licensing agreement and then select upgrade. Here are the next seven for upgrades. Now if no OS is installed, obviously you cannot do an upgrade. You can only do a clean installation or dual boot. So for this, we're going to cover dual boot first. Again, I'm not going to cover the step-by-step -step instructions, but this is what you would do. Notice step 5, list of partitions displayed. You're going to have to make sure you document what partitions are what. That way you install the correct operating system under what partition. You don't want to make two partitions and then accidentally install both versions of Windows that you're installing on the same partition. Each version has to be on its own partition. I say that because if you make them both 500 gigs, for example, and you go to, uh, to set up your partitions and you go to install Windows and you don't document how do you know which one has Windows already installed and which one is the empty one? So documentation here is fairly important. Here are the last two for your dual boot. These are similar steps for clean installation, except with clean installation, you might not have both partitions, but it's the same steps. This is the bootloader manager that will actually display if dual boot environment is detected. Notice it has Windows 7 and Windows Vista both installed. In some of our lab rooms, you might see them labeled all Windows 7 or variations. It's just, it has multiple operating systems. That's all. Here's some issues if you have a new hard drive and you want to do upgrades. Normally, if you're replacing a hard drive, you'd want to copy all the data from your old one to your new one. That might allow you to do an upgrade. But the issue with this is when you install Windows, it installs very specific files and locations that you might not be able to copy or move or touch. So replacing a hard drive and then trying to do an upgrade might be an issue. Normally what you want to do is a fresh install or just reinstall. Okay, now let's talk about what do we do after we install Windows. We're going to assume that we have a fresh copy of Windows installed. What do we do? Some common steps are verify network access, activate Windows, install Windows updates, verify automatic updates are set and working. Install any hardware. Normally that's device drivers. You said and say it. Install your application, including antivirus. Set up your user accounts. Either transfer or restore your user data. And then turn off feature sets that you want. I have an issue with this. Normally, after I verify network access, I activate Windows. If I'm on the network and I'm not protected by an antivirus, I don't feel very safe. So right after I verify network access, I install my antivirus. That way, when you go to download anything, if you go on the web to get updates or anything, you have your antivirus. And it's there, it's updated, it's good. 
you don't want to go through all the steps and solving all your applications, doing all your updates, only to get a virus before you have your antivirus installed. And sadly, th that does happen. Another concern I have with this is, after you install your applications, for example, Office, you want to make sure that you do Windows updates again because what happens if your applications have updates? If you don't do your updates again, you might be missing critical Office updates. So again, step one, verify that you have network access. Basically, bottom right hand side, you want to make sure that your computer shows your computer with a globe for the networking settings. You also want to double check to make sure you have all the addressing portions uh, set up correctly. Not going to cover this right now because we have an entire chapter dedicated to network setup and network profiles. I just wanted to point out that this is where you verify your network access. Next, you want to activate Windows. Normally, you just click on Start, type Activate, and it'll come up with the activation window. You have to, legally, you're supposed to activate Windows. XP would lock you out eventually. Vista 7 and Windows 8, they don't really lock you out, they just change your background to a black background and tell you you have ungenuine or stolen pirated software if you don't activate. Normally activation is extremely important for certain updates because it verifies that you have a legal copy of Windows. Again, let's make sure all the Windows updates are installed or working. Normally, two, three passes, if it uh, takes more, just keep doing it until there's fewer and fewer updates. Sometimes it might take six, seven passes, just go through the updates, restart as it requests, update more, restart as it requests, and keep doing it until there are no more updates. Again, also important to note to do the updates after you have applications installed again, just to make sure your applications, like again, Office, are up to date as well. So let's talk about how do we configure auto updates. Let's be honest. Most people don't bother with updates unless they schedule them because they forget. So how we do that is when you go to updates, we're actually going to change our settings so that we can set updates. Here we have the ability to select what time, what day, and what updates to install. Notice the yellow and blue shield. That means you have to be an administrator to approve this. Here we have install updates automatically every day at 3 a.m. So we're assuming that your computer is on at 3 a.m. Normally I tell people to schedule this late at night or early in the morning whenever they are not going to be on their PC. That way it's updating when you're not using it. Now we're going to talk about device drivers. Again, you install all device drivers. That's every piece of hardware that you have. You go out and find drivers for it. For your motherboard, you check your other board manufacturer's website. For a video card, you check your video card manufacturer. For your printer, same thing. For every piece of hardware, you check the manufacturer. That's assuming you built it yourself. Now, if you just buy a Dell or HP, you can go to Dell or HP's website specifically, and you can, you can download the drivers directly from them because they go to the manufacturer websites for you and normally have the most up-to-date drivers as well. But that only works if it's pre-manufactured. Again, if you make your PC yourself, you don't have that option, so you have to download the drivers directly from the manufacturer's 
by yourself. Uh, device Manager is actually uh, found in the System Settings, which we already discussed, and it lists all of the hardware that's connected. It also lists if the, any is unknown or not working. Here is Device Manager by default. Everything is kind of collapsed. You don't see any errors or anything. If you found anything with an error, you try to find out what type of device it is. Find drivers. Uh, show hidden devices might be devices that are old devices that Windows 7 doesn't use or does not display correctly. Those are called legacy drivers or legacy uh, devices. Next, we install applications. Again, we're assuming that we installed our antivirus pretty early on. If not, we'd install it here. But again, the sooner you install your antivirus, the better. Uh, what happens if you need to uninstall a program? If we go to Control Panel and click Uninstall a Program, we get the Program and Features window, which from this window, we actually have the ability to uninstall software. All you have to do is double click on an item and it will uninstall it. Also notice this is where we turn off or on Windows features which actually we'll cover here in a minute. Next we set up user accounts. Normally if we're sharing a computer we want every person to have their own account. Not having every person have their own account, then you start getting data files that are being shared among the users that might be overwritten, or you might have access to certain things that you don't want your other users access to, so it's easier to make it unique. Every person that uses the computer gets their own account. But what are the account types? Standard versus administrator. Basically, a standard user really can't do anything that affects the security of the computer. The administrator has the ability to do pretty much whatever it wants. So here you type your name and select standard or administrator. We haven't covered the parental controls yet, but if we are setting up parental controls, your child accounts, your kid accounts, would be standard users. And the parent account would be an administrator account. So let's talk about features that we can turn on or turn off. There are some features that are enabled by default that are there. There are some that are turned off by default. But how we do that is again programs and features on the left hand side would actually click on turn on turn off Windows features and we select which ones we want on and which ones we want off for example we could turn off games why you do that no idea but you could if you wanted to it gives you that ability now let's talk about the deployment strategy we've been talking about how to install Windows but is every way to install Windows the same? You have a home user with two PCs versus a business user that has a hundred PCs versus a lab room that has 30 PCs. Do we install it the same way? Well, we can. It's just what's going to make it easier. Normally, we have four deployment strategy types which are based off of how many computers we have or how many computers we're deploying. First deployment strategy is the high touch with retail media. Normally this is less than 100 computers. We would copy it to a centralized computer and we could copy the DVD setup files from that server to all the Windows 7 machines using a uh, user state migration tool 
which we haven't covered yet, but we will, to install Windows 7. That's, again, assuming we don't have a disk. That's one way. For a high touch with standard image, that's for a few hundred computers. Images or ghosts or clone or copy is something we haven't really talked about yet. That is essentially a snapshot of one computer right now. For example, in a lab room, all 30 plus PCs might be identical. So we can install Windows on each machine individually, or we can copy one of the computers that we already set up. So that one that we set up, we make it exactly how we want it. We have all the software we want, we have all the updates installed, we have it working exactly how we want it. Then we make a clone of it. And we push that clone to all the other PCs. Next is a light touch, high volume deployment, which is again, again essentially a pushing of a clone. It's just the more computers, essentially. For the 100 to 200, you might have the clone saved on a external device, like a USB hard drive. But you'd have to have a lot of USB hard drives to do that in this type of deployment. Because here we're dealing with two to 500 computers. So from this environment, we could actually do a network share. Just have a centralized computer, share a folder, put all the, the images there. That would work. Last is light touch high volume deployment, which we're still continuing. Uh, it's just you would use the tools to move the data and set it up. Last time, I'm sorry, is the zero touch high volume deployment. That's when you're doing thousands of computers. And that is a server that automatically does the installation for you. For some companies, that's a huge thing. Uh, if you have too many PCs and you have too few staff, this is a great way to be able to support it. The last is this user state migration tool. We didn't, we've talked about its functions, but we didn't really talk about it yet. Basically, that is how do we move data from an old computer to a new computer? Most of the time, we're going from one to another. So how do we get our user data from the PC? We actually have a lab covering one tool called WET. Windows Easy Transfer is a USMT type tool, and that allows us to select what user data from the old PC that we want to move to the new PC. It's essentially a dumbed down version of a backup. I won't cover the summary slides, but we have talked about planning. We talked about the installation choices, upgrade versus clean versus dual. We talked about what to do after installation, and we talked about the deployment strategies for larger enterprises. Thank you.